in the homeland after 10 years away. Um, this is my wife. <laughs> I, don't, I never thought I'd be able to introduce her that way. And uh, it's a bit of a shock to both of us that we're together. Uh, because when we first met, good eight years ago now, uh, she was slapping me upside the head on the uh, promenade in Deep Space Nine in some scene. Do you remember that scene? There was a I scene in the, in, the story, in the first show ever. Pilot, yeah. And I made a complete joke of myself as I usually do. Being so. a little boy, not used to, you know, life on the frontier. I remember that scene very well. And now we have our own little boy of three years old. Three or four years old. Almost four. And um, anyway, I'm pretty happy to be here. So this is what I normally do, and uh, I don't know about the nun, and I will tell you what she normally does. Why not? No, I mean, no, yes, it's that. Ask questions, you know, and then we answer them. And then we know which way they want to go with the knowing stuff. Yeah, I know. Right? Yeah. 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 Improvisational dance, you're going to do it. No, I'm not. Go on. <laughs> Married. Uh, <laughs> so what we do, well, yeah, we, we just basically feel questions. So if you've got the, the lungs for it, I don't know if there are any microphones out there. Yeah. Just shout them out and um, we will, I will lie and you will tell the truth. That's right. I always tell the truth with these things, horrifyingly enough. I'll so, tell you okay. the truth. <laughs> So who's the first person who'd like to ask a question? You. Oh, you, you, you're lying onto a microphone. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that's the plan. That's really easy. All right. Well, we try and make it easy for you. That's really great. Thanks, because, you know, very little brain. I wouldn't say that. You're a doctor and genetically modified as well. Yeah, well, half of my brain isn't real. <laughs> OK, um, you just did a great show, Deep Face Nine. What are your future plans? Well, that's the interesting thing. We stopped last May, so we've already been doing our future plan. So Dave just finished working on a, a film called The Vertical Limit. He was six months in New Zealand. Amazing, amazing experience. And I'll tell them all about it. <laughs> The musical Chicago, and I'm going to be doing it on Broadway in the fall. So we both just went right out into the world and started doing other things. She's brilliant. She's a, I, it's one of the most shocking things in my life was to see Nana do Chicago. I don't know if anyone here knows the musical very well, but um, you know it? Oh my god, if you see it, you'll want to buy the tape, you'll want to listen to it in the car, you're going to be, it's just going to obsess you. Cause, uh, and she plays Roxy, which is one of the lead characters in, in the musical, with a, an, another woman called Vicky Lewis, who um, is in a show in America. I don't know, it's a show um, called, what's it called? Uh, you know, yeah. your, your best friend's show. <laughs> what's it called? Watched Talk it all the time, I was a fan. Talk Radio! Brilliant. Thanks, Colin. Let's go, let's go going. I'll talk to you about Colin later on. <laughs> Colin's a mate of mine from Africa. <laughs> anyway, so, um, talk radio is like, uh, like Drop the Dead Donkey. You know, the Americans came up with their own version of Drop the Dead Donkey, and it's called Talk Radio. So, uh, Vicky's in that, and uh, these people are brilliant. She dances amazing. Go on, go on, go on do the show, girl. Go on. Possibly just do it like that. But you know that they, 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 they made him train for six weeks to climb mountains, and I have to tell you, because he never will, that he was a brilliant climber. They wanted to take him to Everest and all these places. Um, that it was very hardcore filming, and uh, they were on a glacier for weeks and weeks and weeks. Does anyone a mountain climber here? Does anyone climb? You do. Do you climb walls too? Or uh, technical climbing? Well, it, 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 I'm, uh, seven hours climbing a mountain. Right, a hill, you know, something like that. Don't you ever get the impression, as I did when I got up to the top, or halfway, it would be so great just to drive around it. <laughs> <laughs> we could get up and over this thing when we could really easily drive around it. Anyway, I'm 
so I'm probably not going to become a mountain climber. And in the, but if the, if the most, the unthinkable happens and I crash a plane on top of a mountain, I'll certainly be safely getting down afterwards, you know. Um, but it was a, a harrowing experience for a while. It, it's where do you climb? Yeah? North Wales. Have you climbed at like any really big peaks? Anything over like, what, 50,000 feet? None? <laughs> well, no, because I know that, that, that we didn't, I wasn't climbing at 15,000 feet either. We climbed about 10,000 feet. And, but I know that at about, at about 15,000 feet, the, the brain begins to lose oxygen, begins to become deprived of oxygen, and your lungs begin to boil. <laughs> but Everest is 24,000 feet, or 25,000 feet, and seven, or something. I think there's a technical amount. But literally, at the 15,000 feet mark, people begin to die. And yet, they keep coming back. It's one of the biggest tourist resorts in the world, as far as climate is concerned. You know, people pay, now get this, about 70,000 pounds for the pleasure of climbing Everest. So if you want to climb Everest and you're just, you know, you're not very well trained or anything, you have to pay a bunch of people to take you up. And you have to pay those people 70,000 pounds. And the chance of you coming down is 60%. <laughs> we have helicopters, we have aeroplanes, we have lovely buses and cars, even in Tibet. And yet people climb anyway, so I'm not going to be a climber. Okay. Oh, oh, did we answer the first question? Did we answer the first question? Oh, sure. Oh, you mean what's next now? I, we don't know. No, uh, we, we, we just moved house about uh, a month ago. Um, and uh, we drove across the United States of America with the two boys. And uh, we drove up the middle, really, and then took a right. <laughs> yeah, she was map reader. <laughs> now take a right. Okay. Um, no, she drove too. We both we split the driving. Um, and uh, once we got, we got, we were right. We're living with our parents-in-law, or well, my parents-in-law. And uh, her parents, your parents, I guess. Okay. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. They're really your parents and my parents. Anyway, so once we got to uh, New York State, which is where we moved to, because um, we've got a place in Manhattan which we're trying to build. It's like coming out of Los Angeles where everybody has huge houses. Well, not everybody. It's like, <laughs> you have Mary Antoinette, don't they? <laughs> everybody has huge houses where I live. Um, <laughs> we were lucky enough to have a huge house in Los Angeles. And uh, now we moved to Manhattan Island uh, in New York City, and it's just tiny, three bedrooms in like, on this stage. And uh, that's all we could afford. It was everything we had in LA we got squeezed into this little box in Manhattan, but somehow we're going to enjoy it because we like the, well, it's nearer here, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to move. Um, I don't know what, you know, when I was in England, I used to just look at every aeroplane and wish I was on it. Uh, but my whole life, I was like, oh, I wonder where they're going. <laughs> Have you done that? I'm going they're going somewhere nice. <laughs> and uh, now I just want to get back. <laughs> but anyway, ask the next question. Next, next question. question. Yeah, what was the atmosphere like on the set when you were filming the last episode of DS9? On oh, the last episode? Yeah. I, I didn't stop weeping the whole day. I was weeping. It was, it was, they did it right. Everyone else was fine. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> But I was just like, <laughs> I can't get through it. I was, I, you know, I'm, I'm very tribal, and there have been very few times in my life that I've been anywhere at all for seven years. And I really felt like I was, you know, being told, okay, out to the desert now. You know, you're not in the tribe anymore. And it was, it was very difficult, but it was emotional. And the, the producers made it so that the last, the last scene shot was the last scene that we were all together. So we really knew that it was happening, you know, bye-bye, in the, in the bar, right? Yeah, in the bar, in Vic's Lounge. In Vic's Lounge. Yeah. And the writers were in the audience uh, as extras, and everyone was there. And it was really, we have, I don't know how many rolls of film of that day, of everybody, everybody in the world was ever connected. We have a shot of them from that day. It's emotional. I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't usually cry very much in these sorts of 
situations, but um, I tend to get really mischievous if I can. And um, I think that's the same sort of reaction, you know, like a school child. And Colin Bean is exactly the same way. Um, and so we were sitting there at the, uh, in the bar, and remember there was a sequence, if you remember this thing this, in this show, um, where it, it, it has air, doesn't it, the, the final show of the yeah. Uh, I'm never really sure. Um, and um, there was this thing where Avery Brooks does this quite emotional speech, you know, where we're, we're all going to go somewhere, we're all going to have a great time, and our lives are going to be fine, even after Star Trek, whatever, can't speak. And um, Colin and I just sitting at the bar during every single take, we're just uh, waiting for him to finish, and just as he finished, and everybody's meant to go, that was amazing. Bullshit. <laughs> Avery was not amused. He walked off and refused to continue the scene until someone it was really Colin Meany, because Colin Meany's got a problem with his neck, no? <laughs> Could have been that. Colin, no, 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 but I was surprised to hear that you actually moved to New York. My perception has always been that actors started off on Broadway on treading the boards and aspired to move in West to work in TV and film. That's I right. understood there wasn't much that work in, in the East, so you seem to be taking a backward step. I think that can't be the case. We are. We're very dumb. We are. <laughs> We're not too bright. But um, no, it's true. You're absolutely right. It, it's not the thing to do. But we cannot, I mean, for our souls, we cannot stay in L.A. any longer. Um, maybe we'll go back and do a job or two, but uh, um, it's, it's not a good place to be in, in many, many ways in our business. It's just not, and it's not great for the children, you know. There's not a whole lot of culture going on. So we want to be where we can go to museums and, and be around people who aren't necessarily blonde, you know, it's, 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 you could dye your hair blonde and stand out from the crowd. Exactly. That was my, my <laughs> evil plan. Yeah, it's weird because LA is a, I mean, it's a great place to visit, but not a, for, my, for our money, a great place to live. We're being very careful because a lot of people live in LA, you know, I'm not a screw up. But um, it's, it was like the children's existence was get out of the house, get into a car, go to school. Get out of the car, get into school, get into the car, back to the car, fiddle around, fiddle around. And all they ever did was get into cars and go somewhere and back again. They never, we, people just do not walk in LA. I mean, anyone who's been there probably knows that very well. Um, just, not, just not something you do. I mean, something you get sick of everywhere else. But the fact that you don't have it and you can't do it makes it just impossible to live after a while. And it just seems wrong for kids to do that. And also the fact that they're having a lot, all the, a lot of the problems that are happening in America regarding social. Guns. Guns. I was trying to, but you know, all that sort of, it's really focused in LA as far as we're concerned. And uh, it was just nice, it was just important to get away. And we'll just take our risks, you know, we'll take our chances and see what happens. Thanks so much. Why was your most embarrassing You mean in front of the camera or just, you know, something that, something that happened? Are you asking me? I think of the, I, you know, that question always comes up, and I, I think of, uh, I, I don't know why I don't plan to really concentrate. I can never think of, of what happened. It was, it, My words, uh, no, no, I you have one? I do remember one. Oh, I, I have one. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, anyway, what happened was there was a show years and years and years ago called um, If Witches Were Horses, and it was um, a show about everybody having dreams and just coming true in some bizarre fashion, or everybody fantasizing about some character or something, and it just happened. And um, there was a scene I had with Farrell in that show, um, and it was, because uh, of my fantasy, or was it hers? I don't know. One of, <laughs> 
I think my fantasy of hers was actually just, you know, it, it working out for a couple of seconds. I think it was my fantasy that it would work out for a couple of seconds. So I was, no, it was nervous. <laughs> anyway, that's beside the point. The point was, we were on this, on this bed. You know those beds in Star Trek, which is not designed to sleep on, not actually really sleeps on those things. Um, and they're both like, it's like, it's like the width of my hips and a half. And you just, that's where I sleep. And there are no covers or anything comforting like that. It's amazing what they put up with in the 24th century. But still, sleeping on that thing. And um, I, was, I, was, I was kind of tossing and turning. And then suddenly someone was kissing me. And I was like, wow. Ah. And I must be dreaming. And, blah, 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 and it's Terry Powell. And, blah, blah, blah. and I had this scene going on. And I remember it was one of my first shows on the, in the whole episode. And I was trying to make an impression as a young actor. And I'd been given the, the, the kind of publicity blurb as being the stud, which always made me very fun, it made me laugh, because I was like, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll be a bit studly here, and do some, you know, get on with Terry and make him feel good and everything else with the crew. And so um, after a while, I just leaned over and he over kissed me. It's true, it actually happened. I remember hearing stories about it. You did? Yeah. Everyone thought it was really funny. <laughs> what did she think? <laughs> she said it was great. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you were. I'm sure you were. <laughs> I thought, how long my story was. <laughs> yeah, very convenient. <laughs> my name is Aaron. I'm from Malaysia. Um, I have two questions. First, first of all, I would like to thank you for providing us the viewers seven wonderful seasons of this Space Nine. Thank you. And uh, I have two questions. The first question is for you, Nana. Um, do you feel any change in the atmosphere from acting on screen to acting on stage? Huge. When you think about it, all we're required to concentrate on is three minutes at a time when we're doing film. It, it takes usually last about three minutes. But when you're doing stage, and particularly the musical I just did, where I was on stage almost the whole show, practically the whole show, um, it's, it's the difference between being a sprinter and a long distance runner. And uh, you really have to be an athlete and you really have to have a huge amount of concentration for an extended period of time. And make everything work, not just concentrate on here up, but everything is involved and engaged. So it's much trickier, but it's also a joy because you're in control. They're not going to edit you. They're not going to take half of, you know, one scene that was filmed and then half of another and cut this reaction of yours out. Um, so it's, it's very satisfying. Well, my second question, um, do the both of you plan to act together on screen in the near future? We don't make those plans. We're not, I mean, I mean that's, that, as far as I'm concerned, it's, uh, it's quite candid with you. We, we're just, we're, we're actors who are lucky enough to act at all when we get the chance to act. If we're given the opportunity to act together, I'm sure we'll do it. But my, you know how I think it's going to work? I have a feeling, because uh, I would love to be directed by Sadeg in a, in a play or something like that. So I, I think that's how we'll work together, because he's just a wonderful director. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. After, how many times have you had to play the thing over and over the most from the S9 and why? 25 I've done. Um, yeah. 27? I mean, the kid. Up there. Like, but maybe, yeah. Yeah. 25 to 30 it takes. And it's brutal. <laughs> it's it's really be pretty brutal. serious. I mean, it, it gets harder. I mean, the, the, the movie I just finished, which is just a thing with a man family. And it was like, uh, we were all up at about, and this is not the Deep Space, this, this, I'm just trying to show you this to, to show just what a difference it can be. In Deep Space, it, we may take two hours shooting 25 takes. It would be a waste of time. I mean, people would be stomping around. Producers would be coming down to the set to say, what that's going on? You're taking two hours. We've only got seven days to shoot this show. And all of that, and all that. And actors wouldn't, I mean, in, 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 in uh, an actor wouldn't really care, just getting their lines again, basically. It's like, well, I forgot my line being um, But uh, when I was doing this thing in New Zealand, they would take maybe two days to shoot 10 seconds. 
worth the footage. Not all the time, but that was one of the... There was one scene when we were in a helicopter. One scene when we were in a helicopter. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm sure. One scene when we were in a helicopter. I thought, I, I just wasn't sure whether it was in the stomach or... <laughs> Django, you know, want to rush out. Django's our son. Okay, yeah, okay. So anyway, it's a state 20 seconds, and um, it's this weird shot. They set up a crane. We were on a helicopter, which is an animatronic helicopter, and uh, it was like we were all clipped in because the helicopter, would, literally, the windows were open and it would throw us out. It was trying to land on a cliff and up high on a mountain. So this helicopter was rearing and bucking around, and we were clipped into these things. And if, for some reason, one of our hairs or something came down over one's eye, or, uh, because there were no lines, we did this for two days, we'd have to reshoot the whole scene, and it took about two hours to just put the camera up to where it was when it started. Anyway, cut a long story short, yeah, that was harsh. It doesn't get harsher than that, though. Yeah. Your musicals. <laughs> Hi, um, guys, right. first, I was gonna, you know, I was planning on getting acquainted and then taking over the station, you know, but we can do that in any order you want. <laughs> uh, right, you know, the episode Fascination, uh, third series, um, now there's a scene where you're both, well, all over each other, basically. Um, I was just wondering how much acting went into that scene? <laughs> if, if you don't mind the question. I don't know. That was just before we, we, we uh, got together, and um, it was actually literally just before we got together, like a couple of weeks. I remember it being very uncomfortable because we said, oh, this is horrible, this is, we're, we're friends. Yeah, we shouldn't be doing this, this is yeah. wrong. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then I remember we were just outside the, uh, what, what was that room that we came twirling into? It was a room, it like, was like, a room, like one of those, it was a set, it was a temporary set that kept one, it became a different set every week, but uh, it was like, it became, it was the, it was a room. It was a Star Trek room. room. Anyway. It was a Star Trek room. And then the door was supposed to open and we were supposed to come in kissing, and I remember while we were waiting for our cue, um, and I'm the most, I, I did American soap operas for years, in the years where, you know, that's all, all I had were love scenes to do. And I'm very matter of fact, actually actors usually get a little upset with me because I'm like, all right, okay, bye. So, you know, and they, I don't know what they expect. It's a scene, it's acting, it's nothing to me, absolutely nothing. And uh, I remember we, we've been kissing for a couple of hours by that time. <laughs> And they were just about to give us a cue, and we had to be looking at each other, and I remember going straight into his eyes and going, uh-oh, bad, bad, this is bad. And then we got our cue to go. And that was my first indication that there was anything other than friendship involved. You guys don't think that way, at least I didn't. Uh-oh, bad, this is bad. <laughs> just didn't translate that way emotionally. It's <laughs> right, let's do it again. Yeah, come on. Yeah, I think we can squeeze another couple. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm Tom from London. Um, I just wanted to ask, Sid, um, what do you miss most about England when you're in America? It's a really tricky deal because I, I've been away so long that uh, it got harder and harder to figure out what, what, was, what I missed and what I didn't miss. But I think I miss mostly, um, probably the people generally, that's because although I love the people in America, especially now I've traveled through America, because they're very different all over the rest of America than they are in LA. LA and New York aren't really very representative Americans of uh, Americans. But um, I just like the people, I like the way it works. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I've I, I, I spent my whole life here uh, learning a culture, a language, a, a way to be. Um, and it's ended up being pretty English. So I suppose uh, it was quite easy to say. I miss being English, or miss at least being around people. People always don't understand me in America, or at least a lot of people don't understand me. Um, or they... I thought there was a truck coming on stage. It's the air conditioning. God. Um, so that, that, I mean, I think we're getting a bit heavy there, but that was that basic stuff. But it's nice to just say something in a cab, and someone to go, oh, instead of what? Oh. You must be from Sweden. <laughs> no, I'm not, actually. No, I'm from, oh, Australia. No, 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 I'm English. Oh, of course you are. So it's really nice to just 
fun. I mean, that happens still. Even in New York, where we moved in and da 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 da, going into a store and buying some stuff and coming out and saying, "Well, have a nice holiday. Uh, thank you." And I guess that's the way it's always going to be in America. What do you miss about England? <laughs> I, I miss tea, especially right now. I want like tea. Yes. Well, first of all, I want to thank you both, and of course everyone else who isn't here that can't thank you, for providing a wonderful 50 minute distraction away from the doom and gloom of life. And this is for the other part of the panel. You're one of those people who looks at those airplanes, aren't you? I want to thank you for the character Kira. She starts off seeing you come out of a life of adversity. Probably, it seems to me she probably had an awful lot of desire for revenge which she contained. Um, a certain amount of prejudice against the that seemed at first. And then that became tempted. What was it like playing that sort of character? Did you enjoy it? Was it difficult? And conversely, what was it like playing a completely moral character like the Intendant? It, uh, it was, it, playing Kira was fascinating, and I don't think I would have been, my mind and heart wouldn't have been engaged for seven years if she hadn't been so complex. It's so much more interesting to play a woman that could be unlikable, and you have to find the humanity in, in her, and you have to find something that people will go, all right, she's a racer, she's this, she's that, but I get it, I understand how that happened. It's like having a family member, and uh, you know, that you, you understand why, and that, that's what was uh, interesting to me. And, when, and it was difficult, because I had to, um, think of all kinds of difficult things for sometimes 20 hours a day. Um, we usually shot, later on it got easier, but the, the first few years it was 16 to 20 hour days. And it's, you know, you're thinking about Holocaust situations for that amount of time, so it was difficult. Uh, and playing the intendant was interesting because you, you take the same person, it's the same person as Kira, but just take a left turn instead of a right. So um, I had to be careful. I couldn't just create another character. It had to be the same passion, the same drive, the same single-mindedness. It's just that she didn't have it for her people. She just had it for herself. It's just, you know, supreme selfishness, but with all the drive and fire um, that goes with Kira. So it was, it was fascinating. It was a wonderful experience. Pretty good experience for the blows, too, watching it, because I mean, you don't have to release it to the words. <laughs> I, 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 during these shows, I would have dreams about 
going and uh, being on an operation where I have to go and assassinate Cardassians. And in those dreams, I would feel my heart going because I'm going to get caught. I would feel uh, the, the, the drive that would make me be able to kill somebody. You know, the, 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 the sight, everything. I would feel everything. And, I, and that was my work. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd figure it out that way. You did a great job because uh, you've given me hope that uh, uh, women with the same class uh, can become a woman like you in the end, but uh, I mean, okay. Thank you. That's a huge compliment. Thank you very much. <laughs> because of her. Um, I'm, I'm much, <laughs> I was in a Las Vegas um, discotheque. A whole bunch of women from the show decided to go to this disco and just have a silly time and be in Las Vegas together. And one of us had too much to drink and had this man just all over her. And it was really inappropriate. And I forgot I wasn't Kira. <laughs> I'm like, hey, hey, get off of her. He's like, what? He said, don't touch her. Get away now. And it, it, I, I, I started to manhandle this guy until his five very large friends stood up. And it was like, whoops, time to go. I'm not here. I'm like, I get out of here now. But she's made me much braver. She's made me much um, clearer and more truthful about myself and able to accept the good and the bad together, you know. And, Sometimes, I, as we all do, I, I feel at that, but um, I, I like her too, and I like what she gave me, and I'm glad she gave some of you. Yes? Um, I wanted to ask you about when you did The Invisible Man, you know, the alien voices with John Delancey. I mean, did you enjoy doing that? I mean, I, he played the prick in his girlfriend. It was a little while ago. Do you remember doing that? <laughs> me? No, 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 sorry, I don't know. Did I do that? I knew that I was like, I don't remember him being in that. I don't remember that. What was it? Alien Voices. Alien Voices? With Johnson John Delancey. Oh, yeah. I've got the CD. I'm excited about that. <laughs> I remember doing it. I remember doing it. I remember the guys and I remember the day. I don't remember what I did at all. I don't. Pregnant, I don't. You probably were pregnant. I probably she had a problem with memory when she was pregnant. Oh my god, I did. She couldn't remember anything. She couldn't remember. I'd be like, hi, who are you? <laughs> oh, hi, Mom. Uh, this is, uh, she was very, uh, had a slightly short term memory problem at that time. Yeah, I did. But I know I did it. I did. That was me. And I don't remember what it was about. But I'll sign it tomorrow happily. <laughs> and maybe listen to it too. You did very well anyway. Thank as, you. As you always do. Thank you so much. Hello. Um, this question's for you, well, two questions for you, Alexander. Um, have you actually been to the Savannah to visit your roots? And when you changed your name, how, where did the name Alexander come from? Okay. Um, <clears throat> first question. I have been to Sudan, uh, but I wasn't really thinking of it as visiting my roots, you know. Um, but I, I did go in 1980-something, I was about 16 or 17. As far as I'm concerned, my roots are just everywhere I decide they are. <laughs> and if uh, some of them happen to be in Sudan, great. If they happen to be in France too, I'm going to go and say that I'm going to go check out my roots in France. <laughs> um, because I think everybody should have that freedom. But um, the funny thing is, I, 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 it was, Sudan's a very tricky place at the moment, and it has been for... And my, my family is a, a, a fairly unusual family in Sudan, and we're poised in a fairly dangerous and rather delicate position in being that they're all politicians. Um, so they're in and out of prison all the time, and it's all very tricky. So I don't go back there freely. And I don't have, you know, I'm spending more time looking over my shoulder than looking for my roots when I am there. So I, it was a bit depressing when I went back, and I haven't been back since uh, I was about 17, although it was fascinating to go back. And it's a beautiful country. Um, at the moment, it's not a, somewhere I would recommend anybody go because it's a bit messed up. Uh, a lot of North Africa and uh, West Africa and East Africa is pretty messed up. I was here yeah, the news at the moment. Um, but uh, I would advise everybody to go some, sometime. Just take a boat, go down the Nile, and just let life happen. Just 
pretty. My mother did that in 1969 and she ended up getting married. It's uh, exactly what she did. She took a boat, went down the Nile, got off, saw a beautiful looking man, and decided to marry him. Um, so, it, who knows? <laughs> uh, I might not want to do that, you know, unless you really want to marry a beautiful looking man in Sudan. But, you know, if you do want to, do it. Uh, so, apart from that, the second question was um, something to do with. Um, your name. My name, that's right. When you, when you changed your name. Oh, yeah. I went to a, a restaurant in London, um, Fulham Road, with a few friends um, about four or five years ago now. And uh, I decided, we decided at that dinner party, after having a few small drinks, <laughs> uh, that I should change my name. Why not go on? What the hell? You know, you're in Star Trek now, and at least those people know your name. Change it. Go on. Do, do that. And so that was the reason, one of the reasons why we changed the name. Why I changed the name. Uh, and the other reason was because Sadiq El Fadl, which is my real name, and you remember from the season one too, um, is a really hard name for people to remember. And it takes an awful lot of courage to say, uh, excuse me, Mr. El Fadl, we come over here, um, you know, just casually. So if people would come along the street in America and say, oh, you're, um, uh, um, that spag is the cow. Anyway, Mr. Pat Bay, I don't even the people who I was working for, um, when I was first getting the job, I remember getting a call from the casting director saying, uh, yeah, can I speak to Mr. El Farouk? Yeah. <laughs> and Will Hall? Yeah. Hello, Mr. El Farouk. Um, so in, in the end, I just got, I mean, nah, I can't deal with that. And my mum always wanted me to be called a European name, a narrow name, uh, because I'm, I was, you know, she's English. <clears throat> and uh, so she finally got her, and as far as I was concerned, finally gave she doesn't really believe it, think of it that way. She doesn't think much of the whole, you know, name on <laughs> television thing. But nevertheless, that's what she you know, I ended up doing it that, for that reason too. Is that boring enough with? Um, Happy with that? It's just fine. Um, it, it seems to me that people are just lazy. Oh, that's, uh, I agree. It's great. such a beautiful name, Sidig El Fadil. Oh, El Fadil. El Fadil. Sidig El Fadil. You have to say it the way his. his Sidig El Fadil. I don't know. And 
Uh, anyway, I said to the guys, "Can I, I want that?" And uh, evidently, they, they did me a huge favor by getting it for me. It's huge. It's like that. And uh, it lights up. It's a big, big prehistoric fish that hangs off the side of the wall, and it lights up. It's great. Yep. You haven't got anywhere for it. Really. No, but we have it, and it's like part of the set. And I remember spending so many hours staring at that thing, going, "What time is it?" And it's, oh, it's three in the afternoon. What time is it? Oh, it's three in the morning. And it's like the fish was, you know, constant. And the days just kept rolling by. Um, but no one else was allowed to take stuff. Things were stolen, but not anything huge like that. I was like, I got, I got, I got to take stuff. I got to take my uh, tripod and my med bag and my uniform and all that stuff. Um, which is great, because now I can be like the same person sitting at home going, I used to be Dr. Bashir. <laughs> Going in the supermarket. Hello. Yeah. I was Dr. Bashir, that's me. Yeah. Is it 25 pence for the span or 27? Yeah. Is there a particular song that you sing when you're drunk? And could you demonstrate, please? Is that a particular song that I sing when I'm used? I don't know. Oh, no, no. Do you sing songs when we're drunk? No, I usually have to lay down quickly. <laughs> so the Scotsman just gets more, more of him when, when, when he's drunk. Yeah. Right. Um, in the hills. But we don't really sing a song when we're drunk, I have to say. No. We, I go on. But, <laughs> but you mean everybody sings songs when they're drunk? Well, that man City yesterday. <laughs> I was trying to explain to the now because we were trying to go to sleep last night and uh, it was still pretty hard for the jet lag and everything, but um, it was just all this. things running down your leg. <laughs> but I was trying to explain to her that we, you know, Brits generally like to sing and throw things and hit people when they get drunk. <laughs> and that's just the youth of our, you know, city, fair city, having a great time, expressing themselves. <laughs> and anything that could be banged all night was banged. It was just going to sing and boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Don't you have a Play with Scotland and watch that shit. Play with Scotland. Yeah, be in the land of our fathers for the world's one ever here. Yes. On the same subject as singing, one of my favourite episodes is where Big Fontaine gets Odo to go out with Kia. Now you come from a musical background, how long does it take you to get ready to sing Fever on stage? And will you do it now? <laughs> Okay, who wants to hear a singing fever now? No population, why? I don't remember the words. Oh, please, you should have done it. No, it's true. It's not like dinner, I think. It's because all that, but um, it didn't take me very long. And um, I need a band. But, um, never know how much I love you. Never know how much I care. Dyspraxia, and I found it very emotional. What's that emotion? 
motivational for you? It was, uh, well, to be really honest, um, I was trying to work out what to do about it. You know, because I mean, that's what you said in the script, and then, and you're genetically enhanced. And uh, I was a bit of a gobsmacker, because I was like, well, I didn't know that. I've, I've been doing this show for three years, and I had no idea that I'm actually the bionic man. <laughs> you know, um, so it was a bit tricky as an actor. I mean, if they let you know in advance, you at least prepare for it by occasionally going, Ch -ch 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 -ch, or something, you know, to give everybody a clue that you're something cool about you. No, um, when I did do it, I thought it was a good excuse to do, to do pretty much anything I wanted with the character. I thought it was a good excuse to go, well, okay, let's assume then that everything we've done in the past is just that, the past, history. We can now change this guy to be anything we want him to be in the future. Um, and as far as being genetically enhanced is concerned and being emotional, I'm afraid I'm far too ignorant to have made the connection between those two things because I don't even know what the condition is you described to you about, about your daughter. But would you describe that to me? It's where she's got coordination problems and stalling is very difficult. Ah, now that's a different, yeah, that's a different deal altogether. That was important to me to, that was, that was one of the good times about doing that, is that, is to show that, I mean, that not, not that I was showing, but to be a representative, people showing that there was not, there wasn't, I mean, one of the things that Star Trek does very well, in general, is to pretty much all encompass everybody on the planet. If, whatever the situation, if you just happen to be like Bashir, who's, who was just like a kind of jerk, really, when, when he first started out on the station, if you happen to be like Patrick Stewart's character and you're just a super god, or if you happen to be, you know, seriously, or if you happen to have some kind of handicap, or you happen to have, or in, in the world of Star Trek, as it should be in, the, in this world, which I think was Gene Roddenberry's notion, um, you're still part of the club, you know, you're still part of the gang, you can still come with us, you know, you can still do whatever you want to do. Um, and one of the things that was great about that was it was one of the things that harked back to the original thing that we, I think some of the Star Trek shows have lost a little bit of, uh, is of being really subtle about it and being, but, but still doing that kind of thing. So um, I was, it was nice to do something from the, from, that I thought was very Gene Roddenberry as opposed to just another space shuttle accident or, you know, a time warp syndrome scenario thing that we always ended up in where we always end up with someone else or from some other character from another universe. So uh, that was the nice thing about it. But in terms of, I was, I would have been, I must admit, I was just too ignorant to know that condition myself. So I would never have lashed onto it emotionally. But now that you mention it, I'm glad that it was interesting for you. Thank you. Yes. I have a question for each of you. Um, Nana, what was it like to kiss Nicole before? <laughs> You know, I kissed just about everyone on that show. <laughs> I have to go through my Rolodex and remember. It was, you know, it, it, come on, I, uh, you... <laughs> yeah? It's <laughs> not what you told me. <laughs> you know, the thing is, for me, most of the time, uh, probably barring one experience, those scenes are just technical for me. I know actors say that and everybody goes, sure, sure. But it really is that way. And it just didn't matter to me. Nicole was upset. Nicole didn't want to do it. And I was like, why? You know, it's, it's just what these characters do. She was, so she was nervous. And every man on the set was all anticipatory. and like, yeah, okay. It's like, oh, please. You know, I've, I've got two little boys. It's just, you know, it's just literally my job. So I have to say that um, I didn't, uh, I didn't give it the time of day. I just, and and I tried not to get, uh, it's not to satisfy them, the men on, on set too much with the whole thing. It's just, it's uh, get it across and what it's supposed to be and no more. It's just not that interesting to me. Yeah, and say so I heard that back at a con in Germany. You were asked to bend over in your pants split. Oh, I bent over in my pants split? Mm. It's very likely. <laughs> very likely indeed. It's not the sort of thing that doesn't happen to me very often. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. I, I confess. Thank God. 
Didn't you play a, a practical joke and put something down your your spacesuit once? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's something I tell them. It's what I tell people. You know, they want to know what's the practical joke that you taught me did. You know, um, and uh, I think the, the one thing that we did was a uh, costume, a key costumer on the show called Terry Bono, who's a pretty terrific bloke, and we were good friends. He came on to came up came up to me. No, not came on to me, but you know. But, <laughs> Um, and uh, he came up and said, uh, hey, come on, sir, let's do something with him. And he, he, gave, he gave me a big, big cucumber. And he said, and I had this suit on. It was a, there was a racquetball game we played, and there was like spray on suit that I had to wear. And um, Colin Meany and I played this racquetball game early days. And uh, so I wore this spandex thing that just like did everything that was really uncomfortable for me. And uh, so I got the cucumber and put it down the thing, and it was like all going to be really cool. It was like that being there, like someone from a pop group. And um, so I we went on this, the thing, and we started the shop. And we're standing there, and I had a cucumber. <laughs> and uh, nobody noticed. <laughs> Senior officer, because 
just like every one of those old movies where the nasty little senior officer British men come to go, come on, get to work, get to work, very, very, very good. And everyone loves to get shot, like Big Bashir, basically. Uh, so I, but that had its own fun. Um, and we hope it's, did it offend you guys when you're trying to play darts like that? It's like, but you don't know what you're doing. You can't play darts to save your life. Because I mean, it was ridiculous. I mean, we, uh, there was a scene, I mean, I would never hit the dartboard. And I was the only English in that. But the funniest thing was that the, this, we had this expert come in from Montana one day, a darts expert, to come and show us how to dance. It's not even standing in my life. It's very unprofessional. Yeah. I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> he means it, he means it. So, <laughs> This dance expert came along and he said, okay, and he had his sleeves rolled up and he had all these strange like titanium darts and all the feathers that she plucked out individually and put on and carefully tested and licked the end of and was like, took half an hour to get his darts out of the bag. <laughs> anyway, he got his darts out and he was meant to hit triple six, a triple twenty, that was the point, three times. I mean that was his that was his high for that. First shot. Mr. <laughs> <Mrs>. Dark. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what they get. Never bother with it. It's like, thank you very much, Mr. Expert. Next time, thank you. Anyway, listen, we have to go. Okay, let's go then. Bye bye. Okay. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, stand in the now. Right, before everyone.